Hey, today I'll be talking about the end of the Legend of Junhuan series. One night, Hu, Junhuan, the Emperor, and Duan are discussing promotions, budgeting, etc., and Dr. Wei is there as well, checking the Emperor's pulse. As they are talking, they accidentally, not accidentally, realize that the Empress poisoned her sister. When Dr. Wei recognizes the symptoms, the Emperor mentions the previous Empress and her baby hat. The important thing here is that Hu and Junhuan work together to bring this to the Emperor's attention. The Emperor rushes off to investigate. Just as Junhuan is leaving, Shu Fei, you will fulfill the promise you made me, won't you? My words were soft but clear. As I said, I have no intention of becoming the Empress. She was satisfied. I can only hope that you'll keep your word. The Emperor stays at the torture bureau for hours and finally calls Junhuan in at 3 a.m. She arrives to find the Empress on her knees, dressed down, and Hu watching gleefully from the back. It's the same scene, but of course Junhuan had to be here in order for us to see it. I forgot how great this speech is. All the good lines are there, including my favorite. I say that to my manager all the time. Anyway, the Emperor wants to kill her, the Empress Dowager shows up and won't allow it because remember the previous Empress's last words? The Emperor is angry and pained and says he will never see her again. And so we make it to the spring of Junhuan's 13th year in the palace. Haven't done an age update in a while, so Junhuan is now 28, the Emperor is 10 years older, so 38, and the Empress is 40. Shun Qing is now 31, Junhuan's family, Jun Hong, Yu Yao, and Yu Rao are 32, 25, and 20. We have four princes. First prince, Jun's second prince, Junhuan and Shun Qing's third prince, and Mei Zhuang and Dr. Wen's fourth prince. Then there are six princesses. Xin's first princess, the second princess Wen Yi, the third princess Long Yue, Hu's daughter, the fourth princess, Junhuan and Shen Qing's fifth princess, and Ying's daughter, who's probably the guards, is the youngest child. All caught up? Good. Now more family. The Empress Dowager's oldest daughter, the Emperor's sister, Zhen Ning, comes to visit and brings her own daughter, the 16-year-old princess Hui Sheng. They've been brought in to visit because the Empress Dowager is very ill and they want to bolster her spirits. They haven't seen each other in over 10 years. Junhuan goes to see them, and they are all just over the moon to be reunited. While the Empress Dowager and her daughter have similar temperaments, Hui Sheng is very bright and sharp-tongued, and since she grew up outside of the palace, she doesn't moderate her speech. Junhuan finds her very charming and is not offended at all when Hui Sheng says outside of the palace they call her Yao Ji, something like an enchantress or a femme fatale, a mystical woman so beautiful and charming that she makes men lose their minds to a dangerous degree. Junhuan responds, not just anyone can be called Yao Ji. I don't think I have such an ability. If others insist on talking like this, I can only say that the Emperor is like a demon suppression tower or an eminent monk who can firmly subdue this evil spirit. Hui Sheng takes to her immediately and Junhuan offers to show her around the palace with Yu Rao. As they're walking about, they catch sight of a man looking incredibly handsome and cool astride his horse. Hui Sheng is blown away. She asks who the man is. Yu Rao, surprised, says it's her older brother, Junhong. To her mother and grandmother's surprise, Hui Sheng suddenly starts acting a lot more ladylike. A while later, Junhuan and Hui Sheng take the young princesses out to fly kites. Hui Sheng's kite loses the wind and falls, and she goes chasing after it, and who does she find tangled up in the string? Junhong. So as usual, let's just try to ignore the age gap between the 16-year-old teenager and the 32-year-old widower and just bask in the love, because it's clearly fate, he got wrapped up in her kite string. They start talking and love is in the air. I mean, on her end, not his. He has no interest in getting remarried, let alone to a teenager. News gets to the Empress Dowager and she is not happy. Junhuan married the Emperor, then her maid slash sister married a prince, and then her little sister married another prince, and now her 32-year-old brother wants to steal away her precious granddaughter! Hui Sheng is there and she starts to beg her grandmother to let them be married and she will not back down. Finally, the emperor has to be called in. He enters just as Hui Sheng in tears is saying, status means nothing to her and she would rather have a chance at happiness with someone she really likes, even if the outcome turns out bad. Xunling actually agrees with her. He says, you can never tell what will happen, just like when everyone was telling him not to remarry Junhuan, but now look, she's given birth to a prince and runs the harem so well. It's a sweet sentiment, but also remember that the emperor is eager to remarry Junhong off to anyone. Hui Sheng's mother is convinced and tells her to follow her heart and not regret it. Junhuan is conflicted, knowing her brother doesn't really want this. Xuan Ling smiled faintly, stood up and said, Since you asked for this yourself, you had better not regret it. Hui Sheng nodded energetically, with a smile as bright as a spring flower. Xuan Ling stretched out his hand to caress my cheek and whispered in my ear, Give me a chance to make things up to your brother, and also persuade him to let go of the weight he's been holding on to. Hui Sheng is a good girl. I took a deep breath, looked at him and said, all right. He sends out the edict. Junhuan sees her brother later and, like she suspected, he is not happy, but he has resigned himself to it. My brother stood, basked in the light of the setting sun, staring at the golden edict on the red sandalwood table with a helpless smile. It seems my marriage is always out of my control. 
First, you chose Chen Tao for me, and this time the emperor has made the decision for me to remarry. I have not a modicum of control. Not much else to be said, they get married. There are worse fates than a sweet young spouse, but I certainly feel for Jun Hong here. There's a sweet scene when Jun Huan and her brother are watching the skies and he says quietly, If Chen Tao were still here, I wonder if she would like this. My brother's words hit me in an instant. My thoughts suddenly flew far away and I remembered in the days that when Xuan Ling liked something, I often thought, would Xuan Qing like this? My thoughts wandered further and further away. I couldn't have controlled them if I wanted to. When I did something, was Xuan Ling also thinking, would Wan Wan like this? Everyone just seems to spend their days pining for someone else. Back to the harem. So the Empress will not be deposed, but it's still a battle between Hu and Zhen Huan for who will end up on top. Zhen Huan is totally fine letting Hu take the limelight and sits back as Hu takes over most of the day-to-day -day stuff. She truly has no interest in fighting Hu and meant what she said about letting her take the throne if the seat opens up. We get an update from First Prince and Yi Ren. They are very happy together and I just love that for them. We reach Midsummer and the Empress Dowager dies. Very soon after, we get the news that Molga is coming to visit. You know, everyone's favorite character, the guy we've all missed so much. There's the banquet from episode 72, Molga shows up, he clearly recognizes her. The same little mind games, Long Yue breaks the jade rings. Junhuan goes out for some air, where she runs into Xuanqing, who has some questions for her. He wants to discuss his suspicions that Chishao was not the only culprit behind Jingxian's death. He looked at me silently for a long time before saying, It was someone who's close to you and me. Almost not daring to look into his eyes, I said hurriedly, It wasn't Yu Yin. The smile on his face was a bit bleak. So you also thought it was her. Xuan Qing has obviously put it together, but since Zhen Huan clearly wants to protect her sister, he just lets it go. Which is a good explanation for why later in life, despite all the care she's shown him over the years, Xuan Qing still does not seem to care at all for Huan Bi. Huan Bi shows up and they discuss Mo Ge, deciding that if he brings anything up, they'll just say that it was Huan Bi he saw that day. But after Zhen Huan walks a few steps away, she finds that Mo Ge was listening and now knows for sure that they had an affair. He reminds her that she still owes him a wife. Huan Bi and Xuan Qing are just behind her and Huan Bi makes a valiant effort to keep up the ruse. Mo Ge just laughed. The three of you are very strange. The loving couple from before has turned into a brother and sister-in-law, and in the blink of an eye, the little maid has married her prince. You all might not feel awkward, but I certainly do. Same, dude. Shenqing says not to make fun of his precious wife, which makes Huan Bi blush, and Mo Ge hilariously is like, well, that just proves it. She's clearly not used to you being nice to her. <laughs> Mo Ge is still the worst, but he's actually pretty funny. Shenqing suggests they all return to the banquet. They all settle in to more drinks, and Mo Ge says he has a wild animal to present, a ren xiong, literally man bear, not a real animal. They bring it in, caged, and it is indeed quite ferocious. Hu's daughter, the fourth princess, finds it fascinating and wants to feed it. She's given some meat to toss in, and the bear snaps it up to her delight. Everyone laughs at her adorable reaction, and as it gets louder and louder, the bear gets angrier and angrier. Everyone could see the numerous claws and teeth, but they were not concerned. Suddenly, they heard a loud crash, and the iron cage was suddenly torn open by the enraged man bear. The man bear dragged its heavy body, roaring again as it charged towards the princess. Everyone is too shocked to move, including Hu, who stands as the bear runs right towards her and her daughter. The bear stumbles over an iron railing trying to get to them, and regaining her senses, Hu grabs the princess and runs towards the emperor. Everything erupts into chaos, and because Zhen Huan is seated with her twins and Mei Zhuang's son, it's not easy trying to get them all away. Mei Zhuang's son, Yu Ren, falls as they try to run. If I left Yu Ren behind, I could grab Ling Xi and run away with Yu Han. If I went back for Yu Ren, Yu Han and Ling Xi might be hurt. In a moment, countless thoughts flashed through my mind and my heart almost burst with worry. I caught a glimpse of Yu Ren, his face red from crying, stretching his hands out towards me, his tears falling endlessly. I felt like my heart was in agony. Without thinking, I pushed Yu Han and Ling Xi into Duffy's arms, got up and ran to Yu Ren, protecting his young body. They're doing that anime thing where there's supposedly only a split second between life and death and yet there's somehow still time for a whole conversation. Let me show you the whole exchange and just how slowly the bear would have to be moving. Your Highness, please carry Yuna away. Uh, His Majesty is blessed. How can he put himself in danger? I've heard that man bears will not attack again after eating. Shufei should sacrifice herself to save His Highness. <laughs> Nonsense. How can Shufei be hurt? Where are the guards? Hurry and save Shufei. Mei Zhuang, I will give my life to save this bit of your flesh. This will be the end of our many years of sisterhood. <laughs> your Majesty, don't. Don't look. <laughs> don't move or we'll both die. <laughs> I mean... The bear is angered, but still going. Finally, Xuanqing grabs a spear and tosses it at the bear, killing it. Huan Bi runs into Xuanqing's arms to make sure he's okay. Even if he risked his life to save Bi, Yu Yun was still his wife. 
the closest person to him. Junhuan realizes that Xuanqing saving her looked quite suspicious. Xuanling ignores Junhuan, his attention entirely focused on Jun, who was the only one to throw herself in front of him when the bear attacked. He walks out with Jun without looking at Junhuan, but tells her to meet him later. Late into the night, they meet, and it's pretty much the same conversation. The emperor is pissed because Mulga says he wants her. Junhuan has to agree that sending her is better than losing thousands of men. Xuanqing forces his way in without invitation, volunteers to lead the charge. Is that for me or for her? Xuanqing talks his way out of it. The emperor is like, mm, okay, but you're still getting married to Mulga. Junhuan bows and agrees. Xuanqing leaves, and the emperor hands her some poison. He tells her that after she's married to him, she needs to poison Mulga. He will send troops to follow after her and then retrieve her when the job is done. We've got 16 chapters left now, covering the last three and a half episodes. Final stretch. Late into the night, Junhuan is delivered to Mulge, who is very happy to see that the emperor did not renege on their agreement. He settles in next to her, and they head off as Junhuan clutches the pack of poison. They travel for over 100 miles, and the food and living conditions are obviously way below her usual standard and very foreign to her. Junhuan hasn't had a chance to take action yet, and as they get further and further away, she begins to realize that the emperor might have planned for her to kill Mulge and then herself. After all, what are the odds that his troops will be able to save her before Mulga's men figure out what she did and kill her? Mulga is actually impressed with how stoically she's handled all of this and of course already found her beautiful. It seems he really does intend to treat her like a wife and he's quite nice to her all things considered. One night at camp they talk about why he wanted her and part of it was to get rid of two out of four of the emperor's sons. Now that Junhuan is so shamed it's pretty much impossible for her sons to ever become crown prince. But he also tells her that Xuanling was clearly suspicious of her and Xuanqing and would no doubt have killed her eventually so in a way he protected her. You've been so wronged by the emperor's side. The happiness and safety he couldn't give you, I will give it all to you. He gives her a family sword that's been passed down for generations and tells her that from now on, they are a family. Junhuan recognizes the famous sword and thinks about the legends surrounding it, including that it was forged under the moon for 399 days, which, I mean, that sounds like someone making up a parody of an amazing sword. Junhuan doesn't want to accept it, but before he can try and convince her, they are suddenly surrounded by an army of soldiers on horseback. The men on horseback approach, and Junhuan's eyes fill with tears as she sees who's leading the charge. He looked at me deeply. That year, I made a mistake. I failed to keep my wife by my side. I've regretted it for years. Today, I cannot make the same mistake. Getting off his horse, he challenges Moga to a one-on-one. -on -one. Moga pulls out his fancy moonlight sword as Shenqing promises Junhuan he will get her out of this. Loudly and openly, he said, As long as I, Shenqing, still draw breath, I will never lose Huan Er again. I may not be able to defeat Ke Han today, but if I have even a shred of fear, then I cannot be called a man. He tells Junhuan that she should still live on even if he fails, to which she responds that she won't ever live without him again. He caressed my face, a small tear in the corner of his eye, and said with a smile, You fool. I laughed as well, tears rolling down my face and wetting his shoulder. You're the fool. A complete and total fool. Mulga, watching this, has had enough and throws his sword on the floor. There's no point in beating him. Clearly, Junhuan will never love anyone but Xuanqing. He doesn't want to fight, but says angrily that everyone knows he's supposed to be bringing home a woman from the dynasty's noble family, and how will he face his people now? I heard a woman's soft, gentle voice say, Then I'll go with you. This voice was so familiar that my expression changed drastically the moment I heard it. I immediately turned my head, knowing it could only be Yu Yao. Yu Yao? <laughs> Yu Yao was among the soldiers, dressed in men's clothing, so Junhuan didn't recognize her. She says she knows how much Junhuan loves Xuanqing, and she's watched the emperor let her down over and over again. She tells her impassionately to go with Xuanqing and live a life that makes her happy. All she wants is to make up for the harm she did to the Jun family by letting Moga take her away. Junhuan doesn't want to trade her sister's happiness for hers. Yu Yao's expression was mournful. A bitter smile appeared on her lips. Sister, do I still have a chance at happiness? My heart has already been completely destroyed. Instead of slowly dying at home, chanting scriptures day after day, Sister, won't you help me this once? Let me atone for my sins so I can live with a clear conscience. She bit her lip. Besides, I came here with no intention of returning. Among the sisters in our family, Yu Yao was always the most gentle and weak. But it turned out in the end, we all shared the same blood. We were all filled with that deep, unyielding, stubborn strength. She tells Junhuan that this is her decision, so Junhuan shouldn't blame herself. As Junhuan cries, Yu Yao rides off in a carriage with her new husband. Xuanqing, Junhuan, and the soldiers he brought ride deep into the night. They're heartbroken about Yu Yao, but also in disbelief that they have another chance at love. Lots of I'll love you forever and ever. Finally, Junhuan pops the question of, um, where are we going? Xuanqing seems to think they can just find a nice little town to settle down in and hide from the emperor, but Junhuan is less of an optimist. They find a place to sleep for the night, but in the middle of the night, Junhuan is still awake. 
All she can think is there's really nowhere they could possibly hide from the Emperor. It's not like before when she had perhaps faded from his memory. Shenqing took soldiers to save her, and he must know they're together. He will hunt them down to the ends of the earth. She sneaks out and tells Shenqing's servant, A Jin, that he needs to lead her and the soldiers back to the palace. She tells him this is the only way to save Shenqing. If everyone sees him bringing her back, they can at least publicly say that Shenqing did all of this out of loyalty to the Emperor. As for the Emperor himself, well, cross that bridge when we get there. Zhenhuan leaves the sleeping Shenqing, thinking to herself that he will always be the man she loves most, and it's exactly because of this love that she can't lose him again. On their way back, they run into the army the emperor actually sent that was supposed to pick Zhenhuan up after she killed Mo Ge. Everyone's confused, but no one dares ask too many questions, so they simply join troops and head back together. Just like that, Zhenhuan is once again back in the palace. She arrives late at night to a message from the emperor to meet him first thing in the morning. The first thing Zhenhuan does is ask Jinxi if she can get her mother and Yu Rao into the palace. Then she prepares herself to meet with the emperor. At the crack of dawn, she heads to his hall and finds him waiting. She says she knows there are no apologies she can make, but pleads with him to spare her family. Her mom and Yu Rao are begging and crying just outside the hall, and he says to let them in. This is his first time seeing Zhenhuan's mother, and he is shocked. From behind the screen, my mother and Yu Rao looked like a pair of twin flowers blooming in the light of the bright morning sun. If Yu Rao was like a freshly bloomed duke-kissed flower in the prime of its beauty, then Mother was like one whose bloom had reached its peak and was beginning to show signs of fading. In a glance, he can see his precious Chen Yuan both in her youth and what she might have looked like if she had grown old with him. He can barely speak. Zhenhuan breathes a sigh of relief that her gamble has worked. The Emperor's anger dissipates and he tells Zhenhuan's mother to visit more often if she can. This is how things were. I could never escape or even resent Chen Yuan. Zhenhuan gets his attention and again apologizes, asking for punishment. But he says since Mulga has married her sister and she's now back home safely, they can leave it at that. Making that final move to save Xuanqing, she says, Thank you, your highness, for sending his majesty the sixth prince and soldiers to rescue me. He said nothing. His eyes were slightly closed as if he had not heard me. The bright rays of the sun danced across his face. His expression was calm and peaceful, but in the corner of his eye a small droplet slowly appeared. It was the first time I had seen him lose his composure and cry. He was so tired he couldn't help himself. I covered my face and slowly closed my eyes. Things go back to normal with Zhenhuan just barely outranking Hu. The Emperor has forgiven her her trespasses, it seems, and though it's obviously just for Chun Yuan, whatever the reason, she's safe. She's content to stay quiet in the back as Hu becomes more and more arrogant, pretty much just biding her time until she becomes a dowager. Shenqing is sent to the border, and surprisingly, there's no scene of Huan Bi confronting her after them running off together. She never even visits Zhenhuan again. Even more surprising, Zhenhuan has another daughter, the seventh princess born from that one night she spent with Shenqing after he saved her. Of course, this baby is officially the emperor's. A year later, Yu Yao gives birth to a daughter and it seems is getting along well with her husband. Who would have thought Moga would end up being a good guy? <laughs> Shenqing is loved by his soldiers, Zhenhuan misses him every day, and the emperor hates all of it. Finally, two years after he was sent away, Shenqing returns. Unlike in the drama, he did make sure to return home first, but he does then go and see Zhenhuan and her children. She meaningfully tells him that her princess is 14 months old now, and he, understanding, holds her in his arms. Zhenhuan thinks how lucky the seventh princess is. Her twins were never held by their real father, but she gets the chance to feel his love. Li Chang comes to pick him up to see the emperor. Of course, we can't hear what Shenqing and the emperor talk about, but then Zhenhuan is called in to see the emperor. We have that slap scene. He's rebellious. He's not. Kill him. Hands her the poison. She goes to see him, pours them both glasses. They both drink, and Zhenhuan peacefully prepares to die. The old Sucheru, he dies in her arms. She comes out, and they were like, yep, we had orders to kill anyone else. She becomes Huang Guifei. Huan Bi kills herself at Shenqing's funeral. Zhenhuan finds out about the letters and the note at the end. She Guifei. But these letters were actually intercepted by Hu, who then told the emperor. The emperor starts seeing Zhenhuan less, and she settles into single life. There's flooding all over the country, and the astronomer says it's because of something to do with Yu, Jade. Hu pushes that it's because of Zhenhuan, because her original name is Yu Huan, matching with her sisters Yu Yao and Yu Rao. So she must be the problem. Zhenhuan is told to stay in her palace and ends up being imprisoned for 10 days. When the emperor finally comes to see her, a lot has happened. He tells her that he found out Hu has been lying to him. Long Yue and Hu got into a little tiff, and Long Yue accidentally knocked Hu's jade to the floor and broke it. You remember that jade, the one she was supposedly born with? She was angry, and the emperor told Long Yue she needed to get it repaired as an apology. Long Yue is about 11 now. Long Yue went to the palace craftsman, but they had no way to fix it, so she went to Dr. Wen and asked him to check outside of the palace. Wen went to the oldest, most skilled craftsman he could find and handed over the jade, and to his surprise, the master said he had made the jade himself just a few years ago. The emperor is livid. His eyes were filled with a cold, fierce anger. 
Guan Huan. She had ulterior motives. She lied about having been born holding a jade all those years ago, which is what moved me to accept her into the palace. In order to compete with you for favor and the position of empress, she even used witchcraft to curse you, leaving you so sick and haggard. So... Dude, you actually believe that story? Also, did you just call me haggard? Continuing, the emperor says he ordered her palace searched and found evidence of voodoo against both her and the empress. The jade the astrologer was talking about must have been this. Junhuan is released from house arrest while Hu is demoted to Tyren not to leave her palace without orders from the emperor. Insult to injury, her daughter is given to Jun to raise. A few weeks later, we get another big ol' banquet. It's going about the same as usual, and when Lan Yi sees the emperor is getting bored, she suggests something new. She says lately she's been missing her old animal training days and put together a leopard show for him. The emperor is a bit worried about having such a wild animal here, but Lan Yi assures him she hasn't lost any of her old skill. The other women are very excited to see it as well, so the emperor agrees. Lan Yi leaves to get dressed and she comes back in a green dress wearing a garland of flowers. In bare feet, she leads a leopard who is indeed very well trained. Lan Yi starts by doing some tricks, luring it with pieces of meat. Everything goes as planned and she ends by approaching the emperor and presenting a leopard skin that she prepared for him. He's very impressed with the show and happy with the gift, accepting it and putting it on. Smiling, Lan Yi returns to the leopard, getting on its back for part two of the show. There was a sudden, loud shout, and in the blink of an eye, the leopard suddenly turned its head and saw Shenling in the leopard fur coat. Its eyes suddenly flashed with two golden streaks, vividly highlighting its copper eyes. Its mouth was a forest of knives. It was the very image of a ferocious beast. The leopard yowled wildly, broke through the iron gate, and rushed towards the viewing hall. Can you imagine the CGI this team would have come up with for this? Lan Yi is on this leopard and it's almost upon him, so thinking fast, Xuanling grabs Tian Pian, who is Fu Chao Guiren from the drama, and pushes her in front of him to protect himself. She's torn in half and dies immediately. The leopard is urged on by Lan Yi and goes after the emperor again. In a flash of lightning, Xuanling had pulled noble lady Yue in front of him. She was shocked and terrified, shouting loudly and urgently, her head and hands flailing wildly. This confused the leopard as it could not understand her actions. It paused to stare at her for a moment, and then promptly reached out and grabbed her shoulder, tearing her arm completely off. I don't think this is meant to be funny, but the way I was cackling reading this scene, what is going on? Luckily for Shrenling, he doesn't need to pull any more women to their deaths as his guards finally show up. The leopard did manage to scratch Shrenling deeply, but before it can kill him, it's shot full of arrows and dies. Lanyi is also shot through with arrows. Her last words as she lays dying are, I may as well tell you, Every moment by your side, every interaction with you, filled me with indescribable disgust and loathing. A restrained smile surfaced on her composed face, and she laughed softly like a withering Albizia flower. In this world, only he was truly kind to me. With his death, I have nothing left to live for. Lan Yi dies, and the emperor passes out after losing too much blood. Junhuan steps up and takes charge, telling the palace people to attend to Xuanling and the injured concubine. She looks sadly at Lan Yi's body and sees a small smile on her face. The emperor ends up being unconscious for over two weeks, and when he finally wakes up, his first order is that Lan Yi's body be dug up, cut into a thousand pieces, and abandoned in the wilderness. Noble Lady Yue, the one who lost her arm, is promoted and then immediately sent to a faraway palace where the emperor won't have to look at her and feel guilty. Absolutely dreadful and just what I expected of him. Taking advantage of the disarray, Jin Huan tricks Hu by having a servant send her a message she thinks is from the emperor. Remember, she's not supposed to leave her palace without his permission. She then intercepts Hu on the way to the Emperor's palace, and Hu spits at her that she planned well with her astrologer and fake voodoo dolls. Junhuan doesn't deny it, saying it's what she deserves. Hu is sure she did all of this for Xuanqing and wants to go and tell the Emperor, but Junhuan says the Emperor isn't even expecting her. Hu realizes she's been tricked, but it's too late, and Junhuan says, I hear that with asthma, one must avoid running around, getting extremely angry, or having fluctuating emotions. You have already done all three. You should take better care of yourself. I extended my pale hands and laughed softly. Look at the willow catkins floating about on this spring day. Don't they remind you of fresh snow in the winter? Her face went pale, and in her panic, she grabbed for the mint sachet she carried with her. Due to the violent heaving of her chest, her hands trembled and the sachet slipped from her grasp. She reached down hastily to pick it up, but my embroidered shoe gave it a gentle tap, skillfully kicking it into the nearby pond. With a barely audible plop, the sachet fell into the water and was swept away by the current. The waves rolled gently, and a look of despair covered Hu Yunrong's charming face. I'm just realizing I might have forgotten to mention who has asthma. Sorry about that, she has asthma. Junhuan also had some catkins in her sleeves, which she now releases into the air for good measure before walking away, leaving Hu behind, choking to death. It simply looks like Hu snuck out and had an accident, and Junhuan gets away with it completely. 
Over the next two years, Jun Hwan becomes the emperor's right-hand woman, even helping him with a lot of the politicking as his health continues to fail. We reach the 30th year of Xuanling's reign, 18 years since Jun Hwan entered the palace. The emperor is still relatively young, but not healthy. There are calls for a crown prince to be instated, but no one wants it to be Jun Hwan's kid. So Jun Hwan asks him to make fourth prince the crown prince, which he agrees to. Remember, fourth prince here is Mei Zhuang and Dr. Wen's son. The emperor continues to get sicker and older, and like in the drama, he starts seeing younger girls and drinking get well quick elixirs. One day, Jun Hwan's old roommate Shi comes to report that a noble lady Wang is three months pregnant. Jun Hwan is shook because while the emperor has not put a halt to the nighttime activities, she knows that thanks to the meds she's been secretly feeding him that he is now sterile. The emperor is super happy, laughs, and even promotes Shi just for bringing him the good news. I watched his expression with cold eyes, smiling along with him. Like Grandpa Joe, the good news has aroused him from his deathbed and he wants to go and see her right away. Jun Huan sweetly reminds the emperor that before he goes to see the girl, they need to confirm the date of conception for the record books. Li Chang brings out the nightly records and Shen Ling starts flipping through the pages. His face freezes. He asks Shi just how long Wang has been pregnant and she repeats that it's been three months. Three months?! Shen Ling's voice seemed to contain the fury of 10,000 thundering troops. He hurled the record book at Shi Shen Yi's face, bellowing, you say she's been pregnant for three months, but I haven't summoned her in the last four months! Tell me! Where did this baby come from? It's raining outside, and Li Chang and Jun Huan try to physically hold the emperor back as he rushes to the window and forces it open. He stands there, getting soaked as he starts this monologue, so just imagine this, but wet. Jun Huan screams for a doctor. It's looking bad for the emperor, and the women start crying outside his door. Jun Huan can feel everything she's been working for all these years is finally within her grasp. Like in the drama, she kills the emperor's spy before he can confirm the legitimacy of her children. And, always a supporter of women who cheat on the emperor, she softens the punishment the emperor had originally wanted to give the unfaithful noble lady, knowing he won't be alive to see it happen anyway. Then she goes to her palace to await the inevitable news. Two days later, the emperor finally wakes up and Jun Huan goes to see him. It's the same exact conversation, though the final Mei Zhuang and Dr. Wen reveal is so much more of a gut punch because it means the Emperor's royal line has completely ended. This new Emperor will be of absolutely no relation to him. Jun Huan watches him die, comes out, and... <laughs> July 11th of Jun Huan's 18th year. Fourth Prince becomes the Emperor, and Jun Huan, only 33, becomes the Empress Dowager. Yu Rao ended up having one daughter with Xuan Fen, and they also adopted Xuan Qing and Jing Shan's son, Yu Che, which is such a sweet and perfect ending for their little family. Jin Huan has third prince adopted into Xuan Qing's family line, partly to protect him from brotherly palace fighting, partly because he really is Xuan Qing's son. There is no final confrontation between the Empress and Jin Huan, just Jin Huan getting the news from her eunuch that she died. Jin Huan settles tiredly into her chair and thinks of the past. The light in the hall was dim casting everything in a shadowy green, making everything look dull and lifeless as if veiled by a dark gauze. So many years of bitterness and ups and downs. They'd passed in the blink of an eye and now were nothing but smoke and dust. It seemed like life was nothing but a dream. I smiled, lost in thought.